Good evening, friends, and welcome to Sleepy Time Tales, a podcast aimed at helping you to get a good night's sleep. Do you find your mind plagued with the stresses of modern life, especially when the lights are out and you're trying to get a restful night? Does your spinning mind keep you awake? Follow my voice down the path towards a good night's rest. Listen to me tell a story that will keep your mind from wandering to your daytime problems. The ones you can't solve right now and will be easier to solve while rested. Listen to my voice and allow yourself to drift, following the twists and turns of the story, but slowly letting go and drifting into sleep. Before we get on with the show, I'd like to ask for a couple of minutes of your time. This show is brought to you by direct financial support from listeners like you. Mostly on Patreon, but a good number of people throw a few dollars my way every month via Buy Me A Coffee or even the PayPal tip jar on the website. There have been times in the last couple of years where I don't think I'd have been able to keep this show going without the support and I'm very grateful to those listeners who have had the means to help me fund it, to keep it going and to help me to reach new audiences. So if you're someone who enjoys the show and finds it useful and has a little bit of extra money to spare every month, I'd like you to consider taking a look at um, giving us a a bit of a backing on Patreon. Depending on the level you back, there's um, some compelling bonuses there at whatever level you want to come to. So I recommend taking a look. Please check out patreon.com slash sleepytimetales or go to the link in the show notes or from the website to get access to those bonus episodes, as well as um, simply to keep the show going out to those who need it. And of course, if you're more inclined to make a one-off contribution rather than committing to something monthly, then buymeacoffee.com slash sleepytimetales, also linked in the show notes, is the place where you can go to throw a little bit of a tip in the jar. Also, a while ago, I mentioned that I was going to do some new artwork um, for Sleepy Time Tales merchandise um, and have that up by the end of April. That ended up not happening, but I came up with a very cool design that I got up and running last month. You may have noticed it in the logos and that if you looked at it. And I've got that up on the Redbubble store at sleepytimetales.redbubble.com and you can go get a mug or pillow or t-shirt or something comfortable to sleep in with the new logo that I did, uh, ended up doing it in June. So yeah, go take a look, see if there's anything that grabs you, and um, show the world how much you enjoy Sleepy Time Tales. And speaking of showing the world how much you enjoy Sleepy Time Tales, while money's handy, that is after all how I pay for my goods and services, and uh, buy food for my family and stuff, another huge way to help is simply to spread the word. If there is someone in your life who you think will benefit from listening to Sleepy Time Tales, just let them know. If you recommend the show on social media, make sure to tag me in so that I know and I can thank you. That's at Sleepy Time Tales on Instagram or Twitter. And last but not least, of course, I'm going to give a shout out to the music, which is, as always, Sweet Night and Friends by Kumiku. Their music is available on their website at loyaltyfreakmusic.com and I've linked their website in the show notes as they've got some very cool stuff that they release under various names that I recommend checking out. Thank you for taking the time. Let's get back to the show. So what exactly is Sleepy Time Tales? What is it for? What is this strange thing, this weird podcast that you're supposed to fall asleep to? But lack of sleep is a health crisis in the 21st century, and this is a podcast that is intended to help those that it can to get a restful night. Do you find yourself lying awake at night, mind spinning and emotions in turmoil with anxieties of 21st century life? Do you wake up in the middle of the night and find yourself not quite able to doze back off at 3am? I'm here to help. My name is Dave, and I'm your narrator here to help you into a restful night. Sleepy Time Tales is intended to be used as a distraction to what keeps you awake at night, or sometimes for some people maybe background noise or even just company. That's why I make these episodes quite long, 
so that I'm here for you without putting you any under pressure with the end being on its way. There are a couple of different ways to engage with the show, as far as I know, at least. For me, when I listen to my sleep podcasts at night, it's because I need something to focus on. A story or an event that lets me keep my mind on a specific point, to stop it from spinning out into stresses and anxieties. To focus just enough not to resist sleep when it comes for me. But some people maybe need something a little bit different. Some kind of background, or some white noise even. Some people like the sound of the rain, or the sound of the waves, or the wind in the trees, or maybe just some boring dude droning on in the background. But whether you're engaged or have this in the background, the most important thing is you don't try to force the sleep. Just keep a light mental grip on the thread of the story, and allow the need for sleep to come for you. Now obviously I'm hoping that you're asleep before I get to the end of the episodes. But don't feel pressurized. Especially if this is your first night, the odds are pretty good this won't actually work for you. It might take a couple of nights for you to get used to listening to my voice. Maybe my accent is strange to you. Maybe one episode just isn't long enough. Or maybe the problem isn't so much going to sleep. Maybe your problem is waking up in the middle of the night. What I recommend, because it's what works for me, is to let the podcast run all night. I playlist a whole bunch of episodes of the things that I listen to, and I let them play through as I, when I go to bed. This way, when I wake up at 3am, the stream is still running, and I just pop my earbuds back in and go straight back to sleep again. And you can do the same sort of thing if you find yourself waking up just before the alarm, 30 minutes or 60 minutes. I've had people actually thank me for suggesting that they do that, to go back to sleep right before the alarm, because there is something about it that is satisfying in a whole new, deep, deep level. But however you're engaging with the show, whether it's your background or you're listening, or it's the middle of the night, or as you go to bed, or early in the morning, it's very important that you try to relax. So if you're new to the show, and prone to late nights lying staring at the ceiling, and thinking that this may seem strange, just give it a chance. Because I'm here to work with you, to create a safe space, a cocoon in which you can curl up and allow nature to take its course. So if you're still with me, thank you for staying. If you're already asleep, we'll chat again soon. And of course, you aren't hearing me, except maybe in a dream. This week we return to A Study in Scarlet by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Chapter 3 The Lauriston Garden Mystery I confess that I was considerably startled by this fresh proof of the practical nature of my companion's theories. My respect for his powers of analysis increased wondrously. There still remained some lurking suspicion in my mind, however, that the whole thing was a prearranged episode intended to dazzle me, though what earthly object he could have in taking me in was past my comprehension. When I looked at him he had finished reading the note, and his eyes had assumed the vacant, lackluster expression which showed mental abstraction. How in the world did you deduce that? I asked. Deduce what? said he, petulantly. Why, that he was a retired sergeant of marines. I have no time for trifles, he answered brusquely. Then, with a smile, Excuse my rudeness. You broke the thread of my thoughts, but perhaps it is as well. You were actually not able to see that the man was a sergeant of marines? No, indeed. It was easier to know it than explain why I knew it. If you were asked to prove that two and two made four, you might find some difficulty, and yet you are quite sure of the fact. Even across the street I could see the great blue anchor tattooed on the back of the fellow's hand. That's Mac to the sea. He had a military carriage, however, and regulation side whiskers. There we have the marine. 
He was a man with some amount of self-importance and a certain air of command. You must have observed the way in which he held his head and swung his cane. A steady, respectable, middle-aged man, too, on the face of him. All facts which led me to believe he had been a sergeant. Wonderful, I ejaculated. Commonplace, said Holmes. Though I thought from his expression that he was pleased at my evident surprise and admiration. I said just now that there were no criminals. It appears that I am wrong. Look at this. He threw me over the note which the commissioner had brought. Why, I cried as I cast my eye over it, this is terrible. It does seem to be a little out of the common, he remarked calmly. Would you mind reading it to me aloud? This is the letter which I read to him. Dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, There has been a bad business during the night at three Lauriston Gardens off the Brixton Road. A man on the beat saw a light there about two in the morning, and as the house was an empty one, suspected that something was amiss. He found the door open, and in the front room, which is bare of furniture, discovered the body of a gentleman, well-dressed, and having cards in his pocket bearing the name of Enoch J. Drebber, Cleveland, Ohio, USA. There had been no robbery, nor is there evidence as to how the man met his death. There are marks of blood in the room, but there's no wound upon his person. We are at a loss as to how he came into the empty house. Indeed, the whole affair is a puzzler. If you can come around to the house any time before twelve, you will find me there. I've left everything in status quo until I hear from you. If you are unable to come, I shall give you fuller details, and would esteem it a great kindness if you would favour me with your opinion. Yours faithfully, Tobias Gregson. Gregson is the smartest of the Scotland Yard, as my friend remarked. He and Lestrade are the pick of a bad lot. They are both quick and energetic, but conventional. Shockingly so. They have their knives into one another too. They are as jealous as a pair of professional beauties. There will be some fun over this case if they are both put upon the scent. I was amazed at the calm way in which he rippled on. Surely there is not a moment to be lost, I cried. Shall I go and order you a cab? I'm not sure about whether I shall go. I am the most incurably lazy devil that ever stood in shoe leather. That is, when the foot is on me. For I can be spry enough at times. Why, it is just such a chance as you have been longing for. My dear fellow, what does it matter to me? Supposing I unravel the whole matter, you may be sure that Gregson, Lestrade and Co. will pocket all the credit. That comes of being an unofficial personage. But he begs you to help him. Yes. He knows that I am his superior, and acknowledges it to me. But he would cut his tongue out before he owned it to any third person. However, we may as well go and have a look. I shall work it out on my own hook. I may have a laugh at them if I have nothing else. Come on. He hustled on his overcoat and bustled about in a way that showed that in an energetic fit had superseded the apathetic one. Get your hat, he said. You wish me to come? Yes, if you have nothing better to do. A minute later we were both in a hansom, driving furiously for the Brixton Road. It was a foggy, cloudy morning, and a dun-coloured veil hung over the housetops, looking like the reflection of the mud-coloured streets beneath. My companion was in the best of spirits, and prattled away about Cremona fiddles and the difference between a Stradivarius and an Amati. As for myself, I was silent, for the dull weather and the melancholy business upon which we were engaged depressed my spirits. You don't seem to give much thought to the matter in hand, I said at last, interrupting Holmes's musical disquisition. No data yet, he answered. It is a capital mistake to theorize before you have all the evidence. It biases the judgment. You will have your data soon, I remarked, pointing with my finger. This is the Brixton Road, and that is the house, if I am not very much mistaken. So it is. Stop, driver, stop. We were still a hundred yards or so from it, but insisted upon our alighting, and we finished our journey upon foot. 
Number three, Lauriston Gardens wore an ill-omened and military look. It was one of four which stood back some little way from the street, two being occupied and two empty. The latter looked out with three tiers of vacant melancholy windows which were blank and dreary, save that here and there a to-let card had developed like a cataract upon the bleared panes. A small garden sprinkled over with a scattered eruption of sickly plants separated each of these houses from the street, and was traversed by a narrow pathway, yellowish in colour and consisting apparently of a mixture of clay and of gravel. The whole place was very sloppy from the rain, which had fallen through the night. The garden was bounded by a three-foot brick wall, with a fringe of wood rails upon the top and against this wall was leaning a stalwart police constable, surrounded by a small knot of loafers, who craned their necks and strained their eyes in the vain hope of catching some glimpse of the proceedings within. I had imagined that Sherlock Holmes would at once have hurried into the house and plunged into a study of the mystery. Nothing appeared to be further from his intention. With an air of nonchalance which, under the circumstances, seemed to me to border upon affectation. He lounged up and down the pavement, and gazed vacantly at the ground, the sky, the opposite houses, and the line of railings. Having finished his scrutiny, he proceeded slowly down the path, or rather down the fringe of grass which flanked the path, keeping his eyes riveted upon the ground. Twice he stopped, and once I saw him smile, and heard him utter an exclamation of satisfaction. There were many marks of footsteps upon the wet, clayey soil, but since the police had been coming and going over it, I was unable to see how my companion could hope to learn anything from it. Still, I'd had such extraordinary evidence of the quickness of his perceptive faculties that I had no doubt that he could see a great deal which was hidden from me. At the door of the house we were met by a tall, white-faced, flaxen-haired man with a notebook in his hand, who rushed forward and wrung my companion's hand with effusion. It is indeed kind of you to come, he said. I have left everything untouched. Except that, my friend answered, pointing at the pathway. If a herd of buffaloes had passed along there it could not be a greater mess. No doubt, however, you had drawn your own conclusions, Gregson, before you permitted this. I've had so much to do inside the house, the detective said devasively. My colleague, Mr. Lestrade, is here. I had relied upon him to look after this. With two such men as yourself and Lestrade upon the ground, there will not be much for a third party to find out, he said. Gregson rubbed his hands in a self-satisfied way. I think we have done all that can be done, he answered. It is a queer case, though, and I know your taste for such things. You did not come here in a cab? asked Sherlock Holmes. No, sir. Nor Lestrade? No, sir. Then let us go and look at the room. With which inconsequent remark he strode on into the house, followed by Gregson, whose features expressed his astonishment. A short passage, bare planked and dusty, led to the kitchen and offices. The doors opened out of it to the left and to the right. One of these had obviously been closed for many weeks. The other belonged to the dining room, which was the apartment in which the mysterious affair had occurred. Holmes walked in and I followed him with that subdued feeling at my heart which the presence of death inspires. It was a large, square room looking all the larger from the absence of all furniture. A vulgar, flaring paper adorned the walls, but it was blotched in places with mildew, and here and there great strips had become detached and hung down, exposing the yellow plaster beneath. Opposite the door was a showy fireplace, surmounted by a mantelpiece of imitation white marble. On one corner of this was stuck the stump of a red wax candle, the solitary window was so dirty that the light was hazy and uncertain, giving a dull grey tinge to everything, 
which was intensified by the thick layer of dust which coated the whole apartment. All these details I observed afterwards. At present my attention was centred upon the single grim motionless figure which lay stretched upon the boards, with vacant sightless eyes staring up at the discoloured ceiling. It was that of a man about forty-three or forty-four years of age, middle-sized, broad-shouldered, with crisp curling black hair, and a short, stubbly beard. He was dressed in a heavy, broadcloth frock coat and waistcoat, with light-coloured trousers, and immaculate collar and cuffs. A top hat, well-brushed and trim, was placed upon the floor beside him. His hands were clenched and his arms thrown abroad, while his lower limbs were interlocked, as though his death struggle had been a grievous one. On his rigid face there stood an expression of horror, and as it seemed to me, of hatred, such as I had never seen upon human features. Lestrade, lean and ferret-like as ever, was standing by the doorway, and greeted my companion and myself. This case will make a stir, sir, he remarked. It beats anything I have seen, and I am no chicken. There is no clue, said Gregson. None at all, chimed in Lestrade. Sherlock Holmes approached the body and, kneeling down, examined it intently. You are sure there is no wound, he asked, pointing to numerous gouts and splashes of blood which lay around. Positive, cried both detectives. Then, of course, this blood belongs to a second individual, presumably the murderer, if murder has been committed. It reminds me of the circumstances attendant on the death of Van Janssen in Utrecht in the year 34. Do you remember the case, Gregson? No, sir. Read it up, you really should. There is nothing new under the sun. It has all been done before. As he spoke, his nimble fingers were flying here and there and everywhere, feeling, pressing, unbuttoning, examining, while his eyes wore the same faraway expression, which I've already remarked upon. So swiftly was the examination made, that one would hardly have guessed the minuteness with which it was conducted. Finally, he sniffed the man's lips and then glanced at the soles of his patent leather boots. He has not been moved at all, he asked. No more than was necessary for the purposes of our examination. You can take him to the mortuary now, he said. There is nothing more to be learned. Gregson had a stretcher and four men at hand. At his call they entered the room, and the stranger was lifted and carried out. As they raised him, a ring tinkled down and rolled across the floor. Lestrade grabbed it up and stared at it with mystified eyes. There's been a woman here, he cried. It is a woman's wedding ring. He held it out as he spoke upon the palm of his hand. We all gathered round him and gazed at it. There could be no doubt that the circlet of plain gold had once adorned the finger of a bride. This complicates matters, said Gregson. Heaven knows they are complicated enough before. You're sure it doesn't simplify them, observed Holmes? There's nothing to be learned by staring at it. What did you find in his pockets? We have it all here, said Gregson, pointing to a litter of objects upon one of the bottom steps of the stairs. A gold watch, number 97163, Barbaro of London. Gold Albert chain, very heavy and solid. Gold ring with Masonic device. Gold pin, bulldog's head with rubies as eyes. Russian leather card case with cards of Enoch J. Dreber of Cleveland, corresponding with the EJD upon the linen. No purse, but loose money to the extent of £7.13. Pocket edition of Boccaccio's Decameron with name of Joseph Stangerson upon the flyleaf. Two letters, one addressed to E.J. Dreber and one to Joseph Stangerson. At what address? American Exchange, Strand, to be left or called for. 
They're both from the Guyan Steamship Company and refer to the sailing of their boats from Liverpool. It is clear that this unfortunate man was about to return to New York. Have you made any inquiries as to this man Stangerson? I did it at once, sir, said Gregson. I've had advertisements sent to all the newspapers, and one of my men has gone to the American Exchange, but he has not returned yet. Have you sent to Cleveland? We telegraphed this morning. How did you word your inquiries? We simply detailed the circumstances and said that we should be glad of any information which could help us. You did not ask for particulars on any point which appeared to you to be crucial? I asked about Stangerson. Nothing else? Is there no circumstance on which this whole case appears to hinge? Will you not telegraph again? I have said all I have to say, said Gregson in an offended voice. Sherlock Holmes chuckled to himself and appeared to be about to make some remark. When Lestrade, who had been in the front room, while we were holding this conversation in the hall, reappeared upon the scene, rubbing his hands in a pompous and self-satisfied manner. Mr. Gregson, he said, I have just made a discovery of the highest importance, and one which would have been overlooked had I not made a careful examination of the walls. The little man's eyes sparked as he spoke, and he was evidently in a state of suppressed exultation at having scored a point against his colleague. Come here, he said, bustling back into the room, the atmosphere of which felt clearer since the removal of its ghastly inmate. Now stand there. He struck a match on his boot and held it up against the wall. Look at that, he said triumphantly. I have remarked that the paper had fallen away in parts. In this particular corner of the room, a large piece had peeled off, leaving a yellow square of coarse plastering. Across this bare space, there was scrawled in blood-red letters a single word. Raish. What do you think of that? cried the detective, with the air of a showman exhibiting his show. This was overlooked because it was in the darkest corner of the room and no one thought of looking there. The murderer has written it in his or her own blood. See the smear where it has trickled down the wall? That disposes of the idea of suicide anyhow. Why was that corner chosen to write it on? I will tell you. See that candle on the mantelpiece? It was lit at the time, and if it was lit this corner would be the brightest instead of the darkest portion of the wall. And what does it mean now that you have found it? asked Gregson in a depreciatory voice. Mean? Why, it means that the writer was going to put the female name Rachel, but was disturbed before he or she had the time to finish. You mark my words. When this case comes to be cleared up, you will find that a woman named Rachel has something to do with it. It is all very well for you to laugh, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. You may be very smart and clever, but the old hound is the best when all is said and done. I really beg your pardon, said my companion, who had ruffled the little man's temper by bursting into an explosion of laughter. You certainly have the credit to being the first of us to find this out, and as you say, it bears every mark of having been written by the other participant in last night's mystery. I have not had time to examine this room yet, but with your permission, I shall do so now. As he spoke, he whipped a tape measure and a large round magnifying glass from his pocket. With these two implements, he trotted noiselessly about the room, sometimes stopping, occasionally kneeling, and once lying flat upon his face. So engrossed was he with his occupation that he appeared to have forgotten our presence, for he chatted away to himself under his breath the whole time keeping up a running fire of exclamations, groans, whistles, and little cries suggestive of encouragement and of hope. As I watched him, I was irresistibly reminded of a pure-blooded, well-trained foxhound as it dashes backwards and forwards through the covert, whining in its eagerness until it comes across the lost scent. For twenty minutes or more, he continued his researches, 
measuring with the most exact care the distance between marks which were entirely invisible to me, and occasionally applying his tape to the walls in an equally incomprehensible manner. In one place he gathered up very carefully a little pile of grey dust from the floor, and packed it away in an envelope. Finally he examined with his glass the word upon the wall, going over every letter of it with the most minute exactness. This done he appeared to be satisfied, for he replaced his tape and his glass in his pocket. They say that genius is an infinite capacity for taking pains, he remarked with a smile. It's a very bad definition, but it does apply to detective work. Gregson and Lestrade had watched the maneuvers of their amateur companion with considerable curiosity and some contempt. They evidently failed to appreciate the fact, which I had begun to realize, that Sherlock Holmes's smallest actions were all directed towards some definite and practical end. What do you think of it, sir? They both asked. It would be robbing you of the credit of the case if I was to presume to help you, remarked my friend. You are doing so well now that it would be a pity for anyone to interfere. There was a world of sarcasm in his voice as he spoke. You will let me know how your investigations go, he continued. I shall be happy to give you any help I can. In the meantime, I would like to speak to the constable who found the body. Can you give me his name and address? Lestrade glanced at his notebook. John Rance, he said. He's off duty now. You will find him at 46 Audley Court, Kennington Park Gate. Holmes took a note of the address. Come along, Doctor, he said. We shall go and look him up. I'll tell you one thing which may help you in the case, he continued, turning to the two detectives. There has been murder done, and the murderer was a man. He was more than six feet high, was in the prime of life, had small feet for his heart, wore coarse square-toed boots, and smoked a Trishinopoly cigar. He came here with his victim in a four-wheeled cab, which was drawn by a horse with three old shoes and a new one on his off foreleg. In all probability, the murderer had a florid face, and the fingernails of his right hand were remarkably long. These are only a few indications, but they may assist you. Lestrade and Gregson glanced at each other with an incredulous smile. If this man was murdered, how was it done? asked the former. Poison, said Sherlock Holmes courtly, and strode off. One other thing, Lestrade, he added, turning round at the door. Raish is the German for revenge, so don't lose your time looking for Miss Rachel. With which Parthian shot he walked away, leaving the two rivals open-mouthed behind him. Chapter 4 What John Rance Had to Tell it was one o'clock when we left number eight, Lauriston Gardens. Sherlock Holmes led me to the nearest telegraph office, whence he dispatched a long telegram. He then held a cab and ordered the driver to take us to the address given us by Lestrade. There is nothing like first-hand evidence, he remarked. As a matter of fact, my mind is entirely made up on the case, but still we may as well learn all there is to be learned. You amaze me, Holmes, said I. Surely you're not as sure as you pretend to be of all the particulars which you gave. There's no room for a mistake, he answered. The very first thing which I observed on arriving there was that a cab had made two ruts with its wheels close to the curb. Now up to last night there had been no rain for a week, so that those wheels which left such a deep impression must have been there during the night. There were the marks of the horse's hoofs, too, outline of one of which was far more clearly cut than near the other three, showing there was a new shoe. Since the cab was there after the rain began and was not there at any time during the morning, I have Gregson's word for that, it follows that it must have been there during the night, and therefore that it brought those two individuals to the house. That seems simple enough, said I, but how about the other man's heart? 
why the heart of a man, in nine cases out of ten, can be told from the length of his stride. It is a simple calculation enough, though there is no use my boring you with the figures. I had this fellow stride both on the clay outside and on the dust within. Then I had a way of checking my calculation. When a man writes on a wall, his instinct leads him to write above the level of his own eyes. Now that writing was just over six feet from the ground. It was child's play. And his age, I asked? Well, if a man can stride four and a half feet without the smallest effort, he can't be quite in this sear and yellow. That was the breadth of a puddle on the garden walk which he had evidently walked across. Patent leather boots had gone round and square toes had hopped over. There is no mystery about it at all. I'm simply applying to ordinary life a few of those precepts of observation and deduction which I advocated in that article. Is there anything else that puzzles you? The fingernails and the trichinopoly, I suggested. The writing on the wall was done with a man's forefinger dipped in blood. My glass allowed me to observe that the plaster was slightly scratched in doing it, which would not have been the case if the man's nail had been trimmed. I gathered up some scattered ash from the floor. It was dark in colour and flaky, such an ash as is only made by Trichinopoly. I have made a special study of cigar ashes. In fact, I have written a monograph upon the subject. I flatter myself that I can distinguish at a glance the ash of any known brand, either of cigar or of tobacco. It is just in such details that skilled detective differs from the Gregson and Lestrade types. And the florid face, I asked? Ah, uh, there was a more daring shot, though I have no doubt that I was right. You must not ask me that at the present state of the affair. I passed my hand over my brow. My head is in a whirl, I remarked. The more one thinks of it, the more mysterious it grows. How came these two men, if there were two men, into an empty house? What has become of the cabman who drove them? How could one man compel another to take poison? Where did the blood come from? What was the object of the murder, since robbery had no part in it? How came the woman's red there? And above all, why should the second man write up the German word Reich before decamping? I confess that I cannot see any possible way of reconciling all these facts. My companion smiled approvingly. You sum up the difficulties of the situation succinctly and well, he said. There is much that can still obscure, though I have quite made up my mind on the main facts. As to Paul Lestrade's discovery... It was simply a blind intended to put the police upon a wrong track by suggesting socialism and secret societies. It was not done by German. The A, if you noticed, was printed somewhat after the German fashion. Now a real German invariably prints in the Latin character, so that we may safely say that it was not written by one, but by a clumsy imitator who overdid his part. It was simply a ruse to divert inquiry into a wrong channel. I'm not going to tell you much more of the case, Doctor. You know a conjurer gets no credit when once he has explained his trick. And if I show you too much of my method of working, you will come to the conclusion that I'm a very ordinary individual after all. I shall never do that, I answered. Your broad detection is near an exact science as it will ever be brought in this world. My companion flushed up with pleasure at my words, and the earnest way in which I uttered them. I had already observed that he was as sensitive to flattery on the score of his art as any girl could be of her beauty. I'll tell you one other thing, he said. Patent leathers and square toes came in the same cab, and they walked down the pathway together as friendly as possible, arm in arm in all probability. When they got inside, they walked up and down the room, or rather, patent leathers stood still while square toes walked up and down. I could read all that in the dust, and I could read that as he walked, he grew more and more excited. That is shown by the increased length of his strides. He was talking all the while. 
and working himself up, no doubt, into a fury. Then the tragedy occurred. I've told you all I know myself now, for the rest is mere surmise and conjecture. We have a good working basis, however, on which to start. We must hurry up, for I want to go to Halley's concert to hear Norman Neruda this afternoon. This conversation had occurred while our cab had been threading its way through a long succession of dingy streets and dreary byways. In the dingiest and dreariest of them, our driver suddenly came to a stand. That's oddly caught in there, he said, pointing to a narrow slit in the line of dead-coloured brick. You'll find me here when you come back. Audley Court was not an attractive locality. The narrow passage led us to a quadrangle paved with flags and lined by sordid dwellings. We picked our way among groups of dirty children and through lines of discoloured linen until we came to number 46, the door of which was decorated with a small slip of brass on which the name Rance was engraved. On inquiry, we found that the constable was in bed, and we were shown to a little front parlour to await his coming. He appeared presently, looking a little irritable at being disturbed in his slumbers. I made my report at the office, he said. Holmes took a half-sovereign from his pocket and played with it pensively. We thought we should like to hear it from your own lips, he said. I shall be most happy to tell you anything I can, the constable answered, with his eyes upon the little golden disc. Just let us hear it in all your own way as it occurred. Rand sat down on the horsehair sofa and knitted his brows as though determined not to admit anything in his narrative. I'll tell it you from the beginning, he said. My time is from ten at night to six in the morning. At eleven there was a fight at the White Hart, but by all that was quiet enough on the beat. At one o'clock it began to rain, and I had met Harry Murcher, him as the Holland Grove beat, and we stood together at the corner of Henrietta Street to talk in. Presently, maybe about two or a little after, I thought I would take a look around and see all that was right down Brixton Road. It was precious dirty and lonely. Not a soul did I meet all the way down, though a cab or two went past me. I was a-strolling down, thinking between ourselves how uncommon handy a four of gin hot would be, when suddenly the glint of a light caught my eye in the window of that same house. Now I knew that them two houses in Lauriston Gardens were empty on account of him that owns them, when had the drain seemed to, though the very last tenant that lived in one of them died of typhoid fever. I was knocked all in a heap at seeing a light in the window, and I suspected something was wrong. When I got to the door, you stopped and then walked back to the garden gate, my companion interrupted. What did you do that for? Rance gave a violent jump and stared at Sherlock Holmes with the utmost amazement upon his features. Why, that's true, sir, he said, though how you come to know it, heaven only knows. You see, when I got up to the door, it was so still and so lonesome that I thought I'd be none the worse for someone with me. I interfered of anything on this side of the grave, but I thought that maybe it was him that died of the typhoid inspecting the drains that had killed him. The thought gave me a kind of turn, and I walked back to the gate to see if I could see Murch's lantern, but there was no sign of him or of anyone else. There was no one in the street? Not a living soul, sir, nor as much as a dog. Then I pulled myself together and went back and pushed the door open. All was quiet inside, so I went into the room where the light was a-burning. There was a candle flickering on the mantelpiece, a red wax one, and by its light I saw. Yes, I know all that you saw. You walked around the room several times, and you knelt down by the body, and then you walked through and tried the kitchen door, and then... John Rand sprang to his feet with a frightened face and suspicion in his eyes. Where was you hid to see all that, he cried. Seems to me that you knows a deal more than you should. Holmes laughed and threw his card across the table to the constable. 
Don't get arresting me for the murder, he said. I'm one of the hounds and not the wolf. Mr. Gregson or Mr. Lestrade will answer for that. Go on, though. What did you do next? Rance resumed his seat, without, however, losing his mystified expression. I went back to the gate and sounded my whistle. That brought Mercher and two more to the spot. Was the street empty then? Well, it was, as far as anybody that could be of good goes. What do you mean? The constable's features broadened into a grin. I've seen many a drunk chap in my time, he said, but never anyone so crying drunk as that cove. He was at the gate when I came out, a leaning up against the railings and a singing at the pitcher his lungs about Columbine's newfangled banner or some such stuff. He couldn't stand, far less help. What sort of man was he? asked Sherlock Holmes. John Rance appeared to be somewhat irritated at this digression. He was an uncommon drunk sort of man, he said. He'd have found himself in the station if he hadn't been so took up. His face, his dress, didn't you notice them? Holmes broke in impatiently. I should think I did notice them, seeing I had to prop him up, me and Mercher between us. He was a long chap with a red face, the lower part muffled round. That will do, cried Holmes. What became of him? We'd enough to do without looking after him, the policeman said in an aggrieved voice. On way Jay found his way home, all right. How was he dressed? A brown overcoat? Had he a whip in his hand? A whip? No. He must have left it behind, muttered my companion. You didn't happen to see or hear a cab after that? No. There's a half sovereign for you, my companion said, standing up and taking his hat. I am afraid, Rance, that you'll never rise in the force. That head of yours should be for use as well as ornament. You may have gained your sergeant's stripes last night. The man whom you held in your hands is the man who holds the clue of this mystery, and whom we are seeking. There is no use of arguing about it now. I tell you that it is so. Come along, Doctor. We started off for the cab together, leaving our informant incredulous, but obviously uncomfortable. The blundering fool home said bitterly as he drove back to our lodgings. Just to think of his having such an incomparable bit of good luck and not taking advantage of it. I am rather in the dark still. It is true that the description of this man tallies with your idea of the second party in the mystery. But why should he come back to the house after leaving it? That is not the way of criminals. The ring, man, the ring. That was what he came back for. If we have no other way of catching him, we can always bait our line with the ring. I shall have him, doctor. I'll lay you two on one that I have him. I must thank you for it all. I might not have gone but for you, and so to have missed this finest study I ever came across. A study in scarlet, eh? Why shouldn't we use a little art jargon? There's the scarlet thread of murder running through the colourless skein of life, and our duty is to unravel it and to isolate it and expose every inch of it. And now for lunch, and then for Norman Neruda. Her attack and bowing are splendid. What's that little thing of Chopin's she plays so magnificently? Tralala, lira, lira, lay. Leaning back in the cab, this amateur bloodhound caroled away like a lark while I meditated upon the many-sidedness of the human mind. And that is where I'm going to call it for tonight. If you would like to pick up where you left off, I'm sure most houses have a collection of Sherlock Holmes in them. I know we did growing up. And if not, you can find it on Project Gutenberg at the link in the show notes. Thanks again for joining me on this episode of Sleepy Time Tales, the podcast designed around a bedtime story to help you to get a restful night. New episodes will be released every Sunday night to give you something fresh to help you rest in a new week, but make sure to subscribe in whatever service you use so that you get your new episodes whenever they come out. 
A reminder that the music for tonight is Sweet Night and Friends by Kumiko. Check out more of their work on their website, which you'll find linked in the show notes. Good night, and sweet dreams. <laughs>